Hello, happy Monday. Welcome to Your Gardening Week. I'm Gardener Scott, and I discuss everything gardening so you can become a better gardener. And today I've got a lot of great gardening topics to discuss, some really good questions from last week, and a lot of other fun things that I plan to discuss. I may have just lost the stream, so bear with me for just a minute. Let's see. So I apologize. I'm not showing that I'm going out, but give me a minute to reboot and I'll be right back with you. Okay, looks like maybe I am going out. So um, let me know in the comments how things are looking. Did you lose me or am I still here? I see that we've got, uh, okay, you had to refresh. It looks like there might have been a problem. Okay, looking for a few more comments. Let me know, okay, is the sound coming through and the, vid the video coming through for everybody at this point? Okay, great. Well, good morning. I'm glad to see a lot of people checking in from uh, UK, Ontar Ontario, Montana, California, Tron from Vietnam. That's great. So I guess it was just my computer. I've been having some issues with the increased load uh, in my area with everybody being online. So my monitor is looking good now, and I'll go ahead and continue. I hope you've had a great week so far and that this next week ahead is going to be wonderful. I actually got a lot of good things done in my garden this last week. Yesterday I moved about five yards of soil to fill up some of my beds that I had built. You'll see those in upcoming videos. You'll also see this Friday in my video the uh, first seeds that I'll be sowing for this season. And I'm really looking forward to that. Next week, I'll have a video on square foot gardening, so you have that to look forward to as well. We've got Indonesia, Manitoba, Colorado, uh, lots of good people joining on. So great to see you here. Uh, I want to go ahead and start with a question that came last week from Moved North Homestead. And the question was, how do you make leaf mold? And that's a great question, especially from someone from the United States, because leaf mold is kind of a secret ingredient, I think, that a lot of gardeners in the UK have been using for years and years. But here in the States, leaf mold is virtually unknown to most gardeners. I know very few gardeners that make leaf mold. Essentially, leaf mold is just composted leaves. And there's nothing more to it than that. So it works best in the fall when you're raking up your leaves to just go ahead and create a pile. And that pile will eventually decompose and you'll have leaf mold. You can get fancier with it. You can build a bin like a compost bin and decompose your leaves that way. What I've done in the past is just taken a 10 or 12 foot length of uh, metal fencing, like the, the, the welded wire fencing, and you form it into a cylinder, and then you just start stacking your leaves within that cylinder. You can just leave them be and let it get rained on and let it get snowed on, and eventually it will decompose. Or you can treat it like compost and add moisture to it regularly to help it decompose. If you add a nitrogen component, it will break down faster. But either way, it takes a long time for the leaves to break down. If you have leaf mold after a year of trying, you're doing pretty good. So you could anticipate two years being a better target for making leaf mold, 
But when it's done, it's a beautiful, wonderful, crumbly, dark, organic matter. And it, it's used the same way as compost, but the leaves have a lot more minerals in them than a typical compost pile. And that's one reason I think a lot of gardeners around the world, like in the UK, like and prefer the leaf mold because it has increased minerals in addition to the normal nutrients you get from organic matter. So that's it, quite simply. That's how you make leaf mold. I also wanted to talk today about hardening off because it's spring for those of us in the northern hemisphere and we're either getting close to putting plants outside or we're in the process of putting plants outside. And hardening off is one of those things that I think a lot of new gardeners overlook or they just don't know about. And before you know it, this brand new garden that you're attempting to start fails because you haven't hardened off your plants. So, Katrin, snowy Germany, welcome. That's wonderful. West Michigan, West Virginia, Junction, Colorado. Uh, good to see everybody here. I'll have to run a translate later for Tron to see what you said later on. Oxford, Ohio. Um, Raman uses leaves. Uh, they break down very fast. I'm guessing you're in a, a warm and moist environment. So that's wonderful. And so as I'm looking at where you're at, I'm guessing in West Virginia, um, you're probably already starting to get ready to put some plants out. But as far as Michigan and Ohio and Colorado, it might be a few weeks, maybe even a month from actually putting plants in the ground. So that's why hardening off becomes so important. Think about where your plants have come from, the plants that you're actually wanting to put in your garden. If you're growing them in your own house, indoors, the environment is probably pretty nice. The air temperature, somewhere between 65 and 68 degrees, no drastic changes in temperature, no harsh winds. And so if you take the plants that you've been growing from seed and put them directly into your garden, it's a dramatic change for the plants. They've gone from this really nice environment to now they've got to deal with harsh sunlight and cold evenings and winds that might be drying and rain and all kinds of other potential problems. <coughs> If you buy your plants from a nursery, well, they were probably grown in a greenhouse with very similar conditions, protected. So if you put them right outside, you're going to stress those plants. So that's why we need to harden them off. We need to transition them from that very nice, fine, protected environment to the harsh conditions of outside. And the way you do that is a relatively long, gradual process. So take your indoor plants, <coughs> excuse me, or the plants that you got from a nursery and put them outside. It helps to have them outside on a cloudy day, put them inside a, or put them outside in a protected area in the shade. But the idea is you want to expose them to some outside weather but only for a couple hours that first day. It's kind of a wake up call for the plants. You put them outside and they go, whoa, what's going on? And after a couple hours, they're ready to come back inside. So put them back inside. And the next day, do the same thing. If it's cloudy, you can just put them out. If it's sunny, put them in a protected area. And the second day, you leave them out for maybe three hours, depending on how much protection they have. You can go up to four hours and then bring them outside. And over the course of a week, you're exposing them to more sun, more wind, and more of the conditions that they'll expect when they actually are full time in the garden. At about the weak point in most locations, you can think about leaving them out overnight. And so if the weather overnight and the temperatures will allow the plants to be okay, and what I mean by that is 
40 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit overnight should be okay for cool season plants. For warm season plants, you really want that nighttime temperature to be above 50 degrees Fahrenheit, to be above 10 degrees centigrade. When you reach those conditions, now you leave them out overnight, still in a relatively protected area. And then on about the eighth or ninth day, I have put my plants actually in the position in the garden where I'm planning to transplant them and leave them out overnight. And on about the ninth or the tenth day, that's when I put them into the ground. And from that point on, they're used to the outdoors and they'll do fine. <clears throat> One of the reasons you want to wait that long is because plants can be stressed just in the transplanting process. And so you don't want to expose them to a lot of changing weather conditions and ch changing soil conditions all at once. So it's a gradual lead. -in. Now, the one time that I don't harden off like that is when I buy plants from an outdoor nursery or from a big box store where they're being sold in outdoor conditions. And so in that case, they've already been exposed to the sun and the wind and the nighttime. So if you're buying plants that have been growing outdoors, you don't need to worry so much about hardening off. I still move them into my garden and let them sit next to the, the bed where I'm going to put them for maybe a day. But you can transplant those right away and you shouldn't have any issues at all. So that's hardening off. Spring is the time that you need to start thinking about it. Treat your plants well by gradually exposing them to where they're going to grow and they'll be much healthier. That's, that's one of those conditions you really should look for. And um, uh, it looks like overworked gardeners also talking about cloudy days when it comes to hardening off. Um, Karen Stevens asked how many nights to leave them outside all night long. I, I, you probably asked that right before I got to that point. Now you can harden them off after only a five day period. If you live in a very moderate area with warm evenings and the days aren't too hot, five or six days might be enough. In my region, we have such dramatic swings between day and night, I like to use a nine or day hardening off period. So work with it, experiment with it, and uh, I think you'll find that it's one of those things that if you do it, your plants will grow better and you'll have better success. Uh, Wayne Kerr also wanted me to talk about uh, planting bare root trees <clears throat> because spring is the time that most of us are, are getting our bare root trees and it's the time to put them in the ground. And I've ordered, I think, 12 different bare root trees this year. They haven't been delivered yet. I got a message that said they would probably be delivered in the first week of May. So I still have probably five weeks before I get to that point that I have to um, put my trees in the ground. But if you've already got your trees, uh, now's the time to start thinking about it. And I'm going to go ahead and stop there and recognize Jay Wells. Hi from Zone 10A, um, just starting pepper and tomato seed, seedling, seedlings yesterday. Grateful for the positive energy and keep up the great work. Thanks so much for that super chat, Jay Wells. I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all of your encourage, encourage, encouragement and support along the way. <coughs> and so let's get back to planting bare root trees. So in most cases, the bare root trees that you'll get in the spring, and this holds true to a lot of the fruit bushes that you'll be getting. I've ordered currants and gooseberries, and they'll be coming soon too. They should arrive in a dormant state. And so if they're dormant, that means if the buds haven't started to break yet, if there's no leaves growing on them, Essentially, if they look like they're a dead tree or a dead plant, that means they're dormant. And you should be able to put them outside right away. In fact, you should put them outside right away. They don't require hardening off. You have your site picked out for them. You put them in the ground. Once the conditions reach what genetically they're looking for, which is a certain period of sunlight, a certain amount of heat, then the buds will break 
and they'll start growing. If they have started to send out leads, now you need to treat them as though they're a live plant and you'll need to think about hardening them off <clears throat> because those leaves are very tender. They probably started sprouting in a greenhouse or in their storage facility. They might have even started to grow in the box while they were being shipped. Regardless, you can't stick the bare root trees outside right away if there are leaves on them. So I'll harden them off. You need to keep the roots moist during the entire process of putting out a bare root tree or any type of bare root plant. So the hardening off period might be only three or four days, and it's the same idea. An ex a, uh, area outside that is protected, over the course of a couple days, you expose them to the sun and to the weather so that you can put them in their final location without burning and killing those tender leaves right away. But either way, whether you've had to harden them off or whether they're dormant, now think about the hole that you're going to be placing them in. For years and years and years, it was recommended that the hole that you plant a bare root tree should be dug, amended with compost, you put the bare root tree in it, and it grows. Well, since then, a lot of research has been done and you'll see some universities now that are recommending don't amend the hole at all. And that's the way I do it. I just dig out the hole, a nice bowl-shaped hole, so that the roots have plenty of room to grow. And then you put the tree in. And you want to look at the trunk of the tree. You should notice a junction where the, the tree was grafted onto some type of root stock. You wanna make sure that that junction is above soil level. And you might actually be able to actually see a, a color change from where that bare root tree was in a pot. Make sure you don't plant it too deeply. If you put it in an amended hole with a lot of compost and fertilizer, as the roots grow, they want to stay in that hole because it's a nice happy place with lots of nutrients. Chances are the surrounding native garden soil isn't that good. So when the roots start venturing out and they encounter the bad soil of your garden, well, they're not going to go into that. They're going to stay in the nice amended soil of the hole. And so what you have happening is that the roots start growing in a circle and they can girdle the tree and that's a bad thing. The tree is pretty weak and you might not notice it after a few years, but when there's leaves on the tree and fruit on the tree and you have a big windstorm, because the roots haven't expanded beyond that hole, the whole tree might just blow over. It hasn't been anchored well. So you put it in a hole with no amendments, you fill it in with the native soil, mulch it well. Uh, I like to use wood chips and that will help keep the soil moist because you've kept the roots moist up to the point that you put it in the hole. Just like any other plant, you wanna to continue to leave the roots moist. And that's basically it. Now, I do have a video on how to plant a bare root tree that shows me doing, getting into a little more uh, in-depth information, but treat it like it's a live plant during the entire time. If you get it in the mail and it's dormant, don't just stick it in some uh, out of the way spot or throw it outside <clears throat> and then plan to plant it a week later. It's alive, the roots need to stay moist the entire time. Um, okay, um, let's see what else we've got going on here. Um, lots of good questions. Um, Everyday Treasures is asking about starting seeds with a layer of vermiculite across the top. <coughs> uh, that's a common technique that you also see in the UK. And it's not as common here in the States, but when you start seedlings or when you start seeds, the packet will often say cover with like a quarter inch of soil. An alternative is to cover with a quarter inch of vermiculite, uh, especially if you're growing indoors. I'll usually cover with whatever seed starter mix I'm using. 
Outside, I might sprinkle a little vermiculite in pots and containers. And then in my garden beds, I just use whatever the garden soil is. So that's definitely an option as you move forward. Um, I wanna talk about some specific plants. Had some really good questions last week. And as I do every week, I, I review the questions. Sometimes they just pop up so quickly as I look at the comments and it's difficult to see um, a question. It might disappear before I even see it while I'm talking and explaining something. So I'll always look at the questions each week and then the next week try to answer as many of the previous week questions as I can. And so I had a number of questions that were asking about specific plants and transplanting. So Linda Zelms asked, I'm in zone 6B, when I can I plant potatoes? And Heidi Clark also had a similar concern. So springtime, for the most part in most northern regions, is the time to start potatoes. And March, April timeframe uh, is what we're talking about. Generally speaking, you should start your seed potatoes two to three weeks before your last frost date. So if you live in a very warm area, it might almost be too late for you to start your potatoes right now. If you're in a very cold area, you might be a month away from starting your potatoes. So you have to look exactly for you and your average frost date and start your potatoes two to three weeks. <clears throat> now, that's if you have cold nights because potatoes are a cool season plant and they can handle some cold weather but they can't handle a deep freeze and a hard frost. And so two to three weeks before the last frost date, the assumption is that the nights aren't so cold that it's going to harm the plants and kill them. It can drop down to freezing and the plants will still be fine. But in an area like mine, today I'm going to be in the 50s, a couple days I'll be in the 40s, Overnight, it's gonna be above freezing, but in four or five days, the overnight forecast is for the temperatures to drop back down to the low 20s. I live in an area with a roller coaster of temperature changes. So I'm definitely going to wait until that two to three weeks before the last frost date to plant my potatoes. But if you live in a more moderate area where spring gradually comes on, you might be able to get away with starting your potatoes four to five weeks before your last frost date. And in that case, be on the look for changes in forecast because if those really cold nights do pop up, all you have to do is cover your potato seedlings with a tarp, some plastic, a close, something in that overnight to protect them. I'll do the same thing when I get closer to that last frost date. If cold weather threatens overnight, I'll cover the potatoes just to get them through that cold spell. Uh, and so um, Raymond asks, can you plant potatoes without chitting? Yes. Um, so chitting is a term used for potatoes where you go ahead and let them start sprouting before you put them in the ground. So you, you've seen this. If you buy potatoes from the store and you put them in your pantry and you forget about them and you go to pull out the potatoes and you have little sprouts popping from some of the eyes on the potatoes, that's the chitting process. The potato is starting, <coughs> starting to grow. Well, you can do that intentionally. If you take your potatoes and expose them to a nice, warm environment with a little bit of light, they'll start growing. Just place them in a box on a table and they'll start to send out the sprouts from those eyes on the potato. Many gardeners will chit before they plant their potatoes. I typically do that because my growing season is short enough as far as potatoes are concerned that I want to get a head start on them. You don't want them to grow into full-size plants. You just want that little sprout to be quarter inch to maybe half an inch 
uh, tall, and that's when you put it into the ground. So you could start the chitting process maybe four to five weeks before your last frost date, get them started, then plant them in the ground two to three weeks before your last frost date. But you don't have to chit. And no, chitting is not necessary to grow potatoes. Gardeners for thousands of years have been growing potatoes without having to chit them first. You can just put them in the ground and they'll start growing. The key here is that when it gets above 80, up to 90 degrees during the day, potatoes really start to suffer. And that's why I say I have a short potato season because potatoes are going to need about three months, depending on the variety, for them to actually be ready to harvest. And I start getting 90 degree days at about that three month point from when I put them in the ground. So if I can get a head start of even just a couple weeks by chitting them first, I can have my potatoes growing before it gets too hot. If you're in a northern region where you don't have days that get that hot, then you don't need to worry about chitting at all. Okay, and Rob Oex is, um, I guess looks like you're answering Heidi and you're talking about yours and you say you did chit yours. Um, so this is definitely something to consider and uh, experiment with. If you're gonna be doing a lot of potatoes this year, why don't you try one bed where you chit them and one bed where you don't and see if you notice a difference. Uh, you might not notice any difference at all. So give it a shot, see what you can, can find out. Um, David De Giusti asked, how soon can I transplant asparagus seedlings? Uh, since they're considered hardy to zone two, can they take a small frost? And yes, they can take frost without any problem whatsoever. Spring is also the time to start asparagus in most northern regions. If you're in a warmer area, you probably should have started your asparagus back in uh, January or February. But for those of us that are in zone five and zone six, we're getting real close to the time to start asparagus. I ordered mine online. They haven't been delivered yet. Don't worry about the cold. Asparagus, once they get established, will be among the very first plants to pop up in spring. In fact, they'll emerge from the ground with snow on the ground. I've had that happen. Or they'll emerge and then it snows and they'll grow right through the snow. So they can definitely handle cold, frosty conditions. They are hardy down to zone three, two even, depending on what kind of variety you get. And you want to put them in the ground similar to the bare root plants in a dormant stage. You'll typically order them as a crown and the crown is a root of the asparagus plant. Typically one year old, you can buy two year old crowns and you'll put those in the ground and then they'll start growing. And I actually, when I get my asparagus, I'll have a video on this whole process. Uh, it won't come out till next year because I'll actually show uh, an entire year's growth. But just yesterday I was preparing the soil on my asparagus bed in anticipation of planting them soon. And as soon as I get them, I'm going to put them in the ground because they will arrive dormant. And just like the bare root trees, you want to put them in the ground as soon as you get them in a dormant state. And then you start watering and you mulch and you do everything else that you do typical with other garden plants. And you should see some of those spears emerging in this first year. Uh, tied in with that, MH had asked, can asparagus be planted on a slope? And I would say it depends on how uh, drastic of a slope it is. I've planted asparagus on a slope, but what I did first was to terrace that particular space. So I put just a, a real small wall in front of where the asparagus was going to go, and then I leveled that area before I put the asparagus crowns in. Like most plants, they will do better if they're growing in level soil. So do that with the asparagus as well. 
If it's a really shallow slope, then sure, like most plants, they can do okay. And you'll actually see wild asparagus growing in some regions of the United States where they're growing near waterways, near creeks, and they're definitely growing on a slope. But you also need to anticipate harvest time a few years from now. And do you want to be harvesting or can you harvest in a slopey area? Typically, it works better when they're level. So take that into consideration when uh, you put your asparagus in the ground. <coughs> and then I had another specific uh, question about plants. Um, this one came from Liliette Cordosa, Cordoso. My zucchini plants are six inches tall. When should I plant them outside? I'm in zone 9B, but it's still 60 to 50 in the day and 40s at night. I put them outside the other day and they started falling over. And so I wanted to tie this in because it talks about or it ties in with the hardening off. It ties in with the nighttime temperature and it also ties in with when you should actually start your plants as it applies to your last frost date. And I talked a little bit about this last week uh, in talking about the last frost date. Squashes are a warm season plant. They can't handle any temperatures close to freezing. And so 40s overnight is close enough to that cold temperature range that if you put them outside without hardening them off and they're exposed to those cool conditions, they're going to be stressed and they're going to fall over. <clears throat> so even in zone A or zone seven, it's probably too soon to be putting out those warm season plants without some type of protection, something to help keep the temperature around those plants warmer at night. Wait until after your last frost date to put out those warm season plants. The tomatoes, the peppers, the beans, the squashes, the melons. You need to wait until your soil is warm and the nighttime time temperatures are continually above 50 degrees Fahrenheit to put them outside. If you go before that, you're gonna see exactly what you saw, which is the plants falling over, they might recover, but they probably won't do well. So I would just go ahead at this point and start those same plants from seed outside. And you'll probably see that the seeds that you start outside after your last frost date will do better than the plants that you put in before the last frost date that were stressed and struggling in their first couple weeks of life. And so that ties in as well with Billy Hilton's question, any cheap ideas to plant outside and keep soil protected and warm? And so the protection that I, <coughs> excuse me, that I talk about when I say put some protection over these plants is something very simple. Now, you might have seen my video on how to construct garden hoops. And I've already got hoops over a couple of my beds. And I've just put a simple sheet of plastic over those hoops. That's about as easy and simple as it can get. Now, yes, you do need to find the plastic. You may need to buy it, but it's cheap. And plastic on hoops over a bed will easily keep the nighttime temperature about three, maybe four degrees warmer than the outside air because the soil has warmed up during the day and the plastic keeps that heat in at night. It's a mini greenhouse. And so the soil doesn't cool down and the air temperature around the plants doesn't cool down. And so particularly when you're getting to that range where it's maybe dropping below 50, getting closer to 40 at night, just a simple cover of plastic is enough to keep those plants well enough that it's not going to be an issue. <clears throat> Another simple, cheap, in fact, essentially free way of protecting the plants is to use gallon milk jugs. If you 
get milk, especially in a gallon jug, and if it comes in plastic, cut off the bottom of that plastic jug and stick it over your seedlings. I actually have a whole bunch of gallon milk jugs that I've cut the bottom off. I keep them in my shed. And in some of the beds where I'm growing plants, if the temperature is going to drop too low overnight or I'm concerned about it, I'll just put that gallon milk jug over those little seedlings. And again, I've created a little mini greenhouse. It will hold the warm air around that plant and protect it overnight. And then you just pull it off the next day so that you don't fry the plants by getting too hot. Any plastic cover shouldn't stay over the plants when the sun comes out and you're at 60 or 70 degrees because the air underneath it can get quite warm. So vent the plastic, let some air in or take off that plastic milk jug and then the plant will be you know, perfectly fine during normal warm daytime temperatures. And then if you need to cover them again at night, do the same thing at night. You can also take old flower pots um, or, you know, the type that you get the, the plants in uh, a, a gallon black plastic pot and put it on top of your plants as well if they're being threatened by cold. The idea is to just cover them with something at night in those cold conditions. And you don't have to spend a lot of money. You can just use stuff that you have lying around your shed, your garden, your house, and you'll be fine. So you don't have to spend a lot of money, but those are some easy ways to do it. Okay, so um, thanks so much. I appreciate um, Jay and Rob and Heidi, all the information that you're bouncing back and forth. Um, and so, yeah, I had a question, where am I? I live in Colorado Springs. I'm in Colorado. I'm in zone 5B, though I anticipate, <clears throat> I talked a little bit about hardiness zones last week. I anticipate that the next time that the USDA ups, updates their hardiness zone map, that my region's probably going to move into zone 6A because we've had very warm winters. Hardiness zones are based on your coldest temperature on average. And on average, our coldest temperatures are rising. So probably just like you, my zone's going to change. I'm, I'm gardening pretty much like I am in zone 6A already. So let's go to another question from uh, last week. Uh, this one comes from uh, Heidi Clark and also um, Wayne Kerr. I had raised up the question about, or the issue about using cardboard. And Heidi asked, doesn't the lawn become a green slime if you're just covering it uh, with the cardboard without removing the grass first? And then Wayne asked, any worries about glue and ink on the cardboard? So I've got a video coming up where I'll show how I use cardboard to kill weeds. Or if you're trying to kill grass, how to kill grass. One of the things about cardboard is it is a very effective barrier between what's on top and what's on the bottom. Now the cardboard should be put down wet. That'll hold it in place as you put your mulch or your soil or whatever uh, you're doing on top of it. And underneath it, the grass or the weeds will be moist. But unless you're exposed to extensive rain, it's not going to be wet because that cardboard creates an interface where after it's in place, it's actually going to stop most of the rain, your watering, all of those wet conditions from actually getting underneath it. And that's one reason why it's so effective at killing weeds is because the plants underneath it, in most cases, in, in many areas, will not have the moisture to continue growing. It's definitely going to cut off the sunlight. And I have never seen any issues with the plants underneath it turning into a green slime because it just doesn't get that wet anymore. 
if it does turn into a mushy condition because, <clears throat> excuse me, you've got all that rain, once the ground starts drying out again, it's going to kill everything underneath it. The soil organisms are actually going to feed on all that decomposing grass and weeds or slimy material, even though I don't think that's going to happen. And it shouldn't be a concern of yours because it's completely covered and you actually want the material underneath the cardboard to start breaking down and decomposing. So I wouldn't worry about that at all. It's, it's a, a very effective and, and in a dry area like mine, I'll be using cardboard and it's actually going to probably take at least two years for the cardboard to actually start decomposing. Underneath it, by then, soil organisms will have returned and decomposed that organic matter underneath, uh, but I'm not worried about it being slimy. I am a little concerned, however, to Wayne's question about some of the ink that's used and the plastic. So I only use cardboard that is essentially um, free of color. Now, I'll be using moving boxes that have a little bit of ink. A lot of the inks that are used in these situations anymore are soy based. And so the little bit of ink that identifies where I bought the cardboard back boxes shouldn't be enough of an issue. But you do want to remove any plastic. So any packing tape that was on the boxes, remove that plastic. Any metal staples, remove those metal staples. And I was looking at using a box from uh, a TV that I had purchased a couple years ago. And that box was covered with, with a shiny uh, ink base. And so a lot like magazines. The ink in magazines that's, put, that's printed on shiny paper is different than the ink that would be in newspaper or on a cardboard box. And so if you have a box that has that really shiny surface with the really shiny ink, I would stay away from it. I, I don't know from, of any particular studies that talk about the difference in those inks, but I feel more comfortable using basic cardboard as opposed to the shiny color printed TV boxes that you'll see in the store. So if it's a box that was printed for you to see it and be amazed by the colors, don't use that cardboard. But if it's just basic cardboard, go ahead and use it. And a lot of the glues in the cardboard, believe it or not, it's, it's loved by earthworms. And you'll see this on a lot of other sources where they'll say to put cardboard down as an initial layer when you're starting a new bed, in a raised bed, in a, a large garden area, and the earthworms will eat up the glue in that cardboard in no time whatsoever when the cardboard gets moist. So I don't have a lot of concerns about using cardboard in the areas where I'm planning on using it, but I will be talking about that in a future um, video. And Heidi says um, you, that you use cardboard in a composite bin, or I'm not sure if, if you're meaning compost bin, um, but either way, um, certainly. And I actually use cardboard in my worm bins as well, where I'll shred up the cardboard and in no time whatsoever, the worms have eaten the cardboard. So I use shredded cardboard and shredded newspaper uh, in, in my worm bins and they do perfectly fine. Um, Derek talks about the entire garden um, using Amazon boxes, and they work great. Um, so there you have it. Do be a little concerned about any plastic that's on the cardboard. Remove all of that, uh, but it shouldn't pose too much in the way of concern. And so um, <clears throat> that ties in with a question from Matthew St. Clair. Can earthworms get through weed cloth? I am not a fan of weed cloth at all. And my preference is to not use it at all. <clears throat> and you've identified in your question one of the reasons for that. 
I really believe that the garden setting, the entire landscape should be as natural as possible. And that especially holds true with the soil. The soil organisms should have free range throughout the garden. And that especially holds true with the earthworms. So if you are preventing the earthworms from moving in any area whatsoever, it can have an effect on your soil and the future plants that might be growing in that area. And so weed cloth is often put down in pathways, in large planting areas, and then covered with rock or thick layers of mulch. But you don't need that weed cloth. Thick layers of mulch Thick layers of rock is enough to kill whatever's underneath it. You don't need that weed cloth to begin. And if you do want to establish a really hard underlayment that will definitely kill what's underneath it, that brings us back to cardboard. Because in practice, cardboard works about the same as the weed cloth. With the weed cloth in place, earthworms can't get up and about. The soil organisms are completely cut off from the water that they need, the oxygen that they need. And so in a lot of areas where you put weed cloth, you're essentially killing the soil underneath it. So I don't like using weed cloth at all. And I minimize my use of cardboard in large landscaping areas. In fact, my front where I put a lot of plants in in this brand new landscape, I didn't do anything but mulch on top of the soil because I want a nice healthy area for all of my bushes and shrubs and perennial flowers and annuals and bulbs. I want them growing and I want that entire area to be alive. So I never even considered putting any type of weed cloth in that area because you'll see people that put that'll put weed cloth in huge areas of landscape and then they'll cut small holes and they'll put the plants within those holes well the area within those holes might be alive with some life but the rest of the area isn't so earthworms cannot crawl through weed cloth and there's me jumping up on my soapbox suggesting that you stay away from weed cloth and I also have it planned in a future video. I've been shooting footage of some of my neighbors who have used weed cloth and then put rock on top of it. And in the spring, it looks like it's a complete garden area because weeds will grow in soil on top of that weed cloth. As the wind blows dust around, it fills in the spaces between the rocks, weeds grow, and before you know it, you have an area that you have to deal with a big weed problem. And now the weeds, the roots will grow into that weed cloth, which makes them hard to remove. So I just am not a fan of weed cloth whatsoever. Um, and so, um, okay, lots of other good information still passing back and forth, um, talking about cardboard and the weed cloth. Um, Rob's asking, what's the difference between red wigglers and earthworms? Um, and I've actually had quite a few questions um, I, because I just did a, another video on worms last week where I harvested my castings. And I've had a lot of questions about worms in the last week. So thanks for asking that question, Rob, because it ties in with um, some of those other things that I wanted to talk about. There are many different types of of worms. And they essentially break down into three different categories of worms. And so think of them this way. There are worms that live their entire lives in the top three to five inches of soil. Red wigglers are those type of worms. That's why they're so effective in a home worm bin, because they're going to stay on top of the, the bedding in your worm bin, and they're going to eat all of the food that you keep piling on top of them. They're going to live their entire life in that space. <clears throat> There's a second type of worm 
that is deeper down. And they'll live most of their lives in an area that might be 18 inches to six inches deep in the soil. They'll occasionally come up to the surface, especially in a deep rain, but for the most part, they're living their entire life in that mid-level range. And then there's a third type of worm that lives deeper down. They'll burrow two feet, even more into the soil. And so when you look at your garden, chances are the type of worms that you have in your garden are those mid-level worms. They're the ones that are operating at root depth. They're moving through the soil. They're eating all that good organic material that you've added to your soil. Things like compost, like aged manure. That's what those type of worms are eating. And then occasionally they'll come up to the surface and they'll feed on the bottom of your thick mulch and they'll bring it back into the soil. So that's why earthworms are, are so great at moving nutrients throughout the soil because they'll feed on the bottom of the organic compost that you have on the top and they'll feed within the material that you have within your soil. And that third type of earthworm, those are typically those really big night crawlers. And so you can almost guess at the depth that the worms live on the size of the worm. Red wigglers are pretty small worms. And they're living close to the surface. Most of the worms you'll see when you're digging in your beds are bigger than the red wigglers. You know, they might be four or five inches long. They're in that mid-level. And the night crawlers are eight inches long and more because they're burrowing deeper into soil that is more compacted. So it needs to be a bigger, more robust worm with more muscles to move it through the soil. If you want to add worms to your garden, you need to think about these different categories of worms. Because in my region, the soil freezes inches deep a foot deep. <clears throat> as far as the building codes are concerned, my soil freezes 18 to 24 inches deep. Now in practice, I don't think it really freezes that deep, but we do have very cold winters. So the red wigglers, if I were to add them to my garden, they would freeze and die in the winter because the soil freezes deep enough that they can't burrow down to get below the frost line. Those mid-level worms can burrow down deep. They're not going to go down two feet, but what I'm finding right now as I've started working in my garden and start preparing some of the beds is I'm finding some of these mid-level worms that are actually curled up into little balls. And that's a way that they can retain some of their little body heat and fight off some of those frost conditions that are starting to permeate the soil. But those night crawlers, they're surviving well beneath the frost line. So when it comes to adding those worms, don't add the red wigglers and expect them to survive the winter unless you live in a very warm area where the soil doesn't freeze. And then they'll survive fine. In fact, if you live in one of those regions, um, like a zone 10, for instance, where it's warm year round, you can have red wigglers in your compost pile. You can have red wigglers in your garden beds. You can have red wigglers inside. But for the rest of us, you need to look to a source for those other types of worms. And, and you can find some of them online. You might even actually have a worm store in your area. But definitely ask about the type of worm and how you're going to use it. And in your garden, that's what you want, is those uh, mid-level to deep worms. Okay, um, <clears throat> a question from Zerab Kasidi. I used hot pepper spray to deter squirrels from my garden, but now I feel sorry for them. How do you deal with them? That's a great question. And for the most part, I don't deal with them. I, I let my neighbors deal with them, if you will. So I don't have a big squirrel population at my current house. 
And so I haven't had to deal with them. But at my last house, in my last garden, and you'll see that garden in some of my previous videos, I had a huge squirrel problem. And what I mean when I say I let my neighbors deal with them, well, my neighbors loved to feed the birds. So they had a huge setup of bird feeders. And so put yourself in the tiny brain of a squirrel. Do you want to expose yourself to open ground to run into a garden where you might become a victim of a hawk that is circling overhead? And I had a lot of hawks circling over my area. Or do you want to stay under the cover of the trees and eat all of the bird seed that has fallen out of the bird feeders? Or crawl up a little bit and eat some of those delicious peanuts that were put out for the Blue Jays. <clears throat> so my garden had very few, I don't know if I ever had any problems with my garden plants that were squirrel related because my neighbor fed the squirrels. Now my brother-in-law follows a very similar course of action. They don't have a big garden, they just grow a few things close to the house, but they have a squirrel feeder on their fence and they'll buy the nuts for the squirrels. It's the same idea. If you, instead of trying to get rid of the squirrels, if you welcome the squirrels and give them food, <clears throat> they're gonna go for the easy food. They're not gonna go for the tough food. So they're not going to be digging up your garden. They're not going to, be, to eat anything as it gets ready to harvest. They're going to eat whatever it is you put out for them to eat. And you can actually, find squirrel houses that are designed for putting the food in for the squirrels. I have found that to be the most effective way. Now, yes, you might have to buy or you might have to uh, use some food from your kitchen to feed the squirrels, but it's a balance of what you want to do as far as protecting your garden. Because red pepper spray, any of those other things that that do work to deter squirrels only work for a brief period. And once you water or once it rains, whatever you've sprayed on is going to wash off and they're going to come right back. And if you wanna trap or kill the squirrels, well, that's also a very short-term fix because there are many squirrels out there. And if you've got a squirrel problem, by trapping or killing one squirrel, you're just making room for another squirrel to move in. So I don't even find those methods to be very effective either. Consider feeding them, consider bringing them into your overall healthy environment because they do serve a purpose. I've, had, I've seen squirrels eating the weeds, the seed heads of the weeds around the edges of my garden. So I don't try to get rid of them. I just try to keep them away from the plants that I'm trying to protect. And that's been uh, the best uh, solution. Um, you learn Jay says fat squirrels are lazy. Exactly. So if you, if you get them to the point that they're fat, now they don't want to move away from that dedicated food source and they're never going to go to the effort of disturbing uh, your garden at all. Um, and pretty Alice Moon, welcome. Um, also talking about the squirrels in the yard, feeding the birds, dozens of squirrels, messed it all up. Yes, they can create a mess um, in a particular area. And so that's why I think my brother-in-law has a good solution. He, he uses the shelled nuts because if you give them a peanut, for instance, they'll eat the nut and they'll drop the shell. If you feed them sunflower seeds, they'll shell the sunflower and they'll drop it down and it'll create a big mess as well. But if you give them some hold seed of some type uh, and, and you'll get used to what your squirrels expect if you take this approach. Don't overfeed them, just give them enough that they come out in the morning looking for their food, they eat what you gave them, now they go back and they're fat and lazy for the rest of the day and then you continue that process. Um, and T, I'm guessing TN Mountain Morning is Tennessee Mountain Morning. 
Um, and uh, thank you. I love my approach to gardening as well because it's one of those things that <clears throat> if you look at the system of the planet as it probably should be, and you bring that down to your garden and how it should be, you'll find that they match. And so look back into the days when mankind wasn't moving around destroying the planet. And you can still see that in many areas. How does nature work? A tree grows, drops its leaves. Underneath that tree, other plants grow and animals exist. And everything works close to balance. In an area where it goes out of balance, and now you have a, a dry scape, an area that very few plants are growing, you'll see some plants that start to grow first. And these are the plants that we often think of as weeds. And their sole purpose in this big cycle is to grow in soil that no other plant can grow in. And that's why reed, weeds are so hard to get rid of, is because they have been genetically evolved over time to grow in areas that are very poor. But that's a good thing for the entire balance of the system, because once these weedy plants take hold, now the next year when the trees drop their leaves and the wind comes and the, and the leaves start blowing, some of those leaves are going to be trapped around that weedy plant. And then those leaves will start decomposing. They'll create leaf mold. And so that leaf mold, that decomposed material from the leaves is high in nutrients and minerals. And so now other seeds will blow in, but these are the type of seeds that like a soil that isn't so poor. And so they'll find that area that has been improved with that leaf mold of nature and they'll start growing. And a lot of those plants are the legumes, the kind of plants that, that actually can fix nitrogen in their roots. And so as they die, as they decompose into the soil, they're increasing the nitrogen component within the soil. And now more seeds come in and create flowers and grasses. And that's how the cycle continues. And those grasses will eventually harbor an area that is suitable for trees. And so, so now more trees grow. And so if you look at your garden from that perspective, where even weeds serve a purpose, even squirrels serve a purpose, you just have to figure out what that purpose is. And I've been thinking about this in the last couple of days because I have a pretty big rabbit population. And so I've been considering ways to control my rabbits and maybe even get rid of the rabbits in my yard and in my garden. But as I started observing the rabbits, I realized that especially this time of year, they're eating the very first plants that are popping up. And because I haven't put a garden in place yet, the very first plants that are popping up are weeds. So the rabbits are actually taking care of my weed problem before it becomes a problem. In the exterior of my yard, near the fence line, the rabbits are eating the weeds. As they venture out into some of the areas around my beds, they're eating the weeds. Now I grow in raised beds and I'll start putting in some fencing around some of these beds to keep the rabbits out, but they're not interested with what's happening in this bed that is 18 inches high. They can't even see it. They're not likely to jump into that bed when they have all of these young, tender weeds that are growing. So even rabbits have a purpose. And, and that plays in with my general philosophy of gardening is let everything work together. Try not to upset the balance. Try to figure out what the balance is in your particular area and work to feed the balance. That might be soil amendments, like I talked about in my recent soil video. It might be encouraging birds. It might be encouraging bees. Figure out what is out of balance in your area. And I've noticed in my new garden, 
but it's out of balance. You can expect that when you're brand new in gardening and when you're just starting a garden. It's going to be out of balance. So start thinking about how to get it into balance. I noticed some bees yesterday. I've never seen this before. The bees were almost swarming my wood pile. And so I stopped, I actually shot some video of this and I'll put it in some future video. I couldn't figure out why the bees were on my wood pile. And as I looked closer, I realized that I had some aspen trees that came from my brother-in-law's yard. He cut down at the end of this last year, cut them up, I put them in my wood pile, we'll burn them in the fire pit as the summer progresses. But these are relatively young logs. And so there was still a lot of moisture in that wood. And as the day was warming up yesterday, I noticed some of that moisture was seeping out of the logs. And the bees were covering the logs, sopping up that moisture, which I'm guessing has a little bit of sugar in it from the sap that might have been remaining in that log. And so there's very few flowers in my garden right now. And there's very few flowers in my neighborhood, but the bees are out. And they discovered my wood pile and were licking up the sap from those cut logs. Now, who would have imagined? I've never seen this referenced in any book or in any blog, but I observed it and I analyzed it and I figured out that that's one of the ways my garden is out of balance. The bees need a source of moisture and of food, and all they can find is those logs. So this year, I'll be planting a lot of early flowering plants, and I'll have a water source within my garden so that next year when the bees emerge, Hopefully my yard will offer them some of what they need, not just some cut up logs. And as I proceed through the season, I'm gonna be looking more and more at those type of indications. How is my garden out of balance? And what can I do to bring it into balance? And you can do the same thing. If you notice that you've got plants suffering in one particular area of your garden or landscape, and you think you're doing everything right, well, you might be doing everything right, except that maybe the soil balance is off, or maybe the balance of the pollinators is off. And so this becomes a philosophy of gardening, and it's how I garden, where I look for what's missing, and I try to add that. And it might be earthworms, it might be bees, it might be birds. I'm not going to intentionally add squirrels to my garden, but if squirrels find my garden, then that tells me that I've achieved a level of balance because the squirrels are now coming in to deal with whatever issue brings the squirrels. So think about that as you move forward with your gardening and as you try to develop your own gardening philosophy, think about if balance can really play a role in how you move forward. So, um, I don't want to repeat that, Jay Dixon, but appreciate um, a lot of the comments that are coming back and forth. Um, I appreciate all of what you're doing. Um, let's get to um, a question that uh, kind of ties in. It comes from um, Raymond Satyadi. How do I deter stray cats from pooping in my garden? And so... I put cats and dogs in a separate category when it comes to the balance of the garden. I'm looking for a natural garden space. I'm looking for creating something that nature would have created. Well, chances are in nature, in a forest, in a garden setting, cats and dogs are not a natural part of that setting. So I do act to keep cats and dogs out of the garden. One of the ways you can keep cats out is by making it an area that they don't want to go. 
And so in your garden beds, wherever it is that you see the cats are pooping, take something like chicken wire or hardware cloth, something that you can place on top of the soil around the plants. Because when the cats now jump into that bed, they've got pretty tender paws. And so the pads, the bottom of their paws, when they're walking on that chicken wire or, or walking on that hardware cloth, it's going to be uncomfortable. It might even hurt. They don't want to be in that area anymore. So they will cl they'll quickly vacate it. Now they'll look for another area because if they've learned that your garden is where they go to poop, that your garden is their box, they will continue to go to your garden. So you may need to put that wire or that hardware cloth on top of all of your beds just to deter the cats. This also kind of plays in with the idea of feeding your squirrels. Give them a litter box. And so if you've got a spot in an out of the way location, go ahead and build a little sandbox not for kids, but for the cats. And so if they come to your yard because it's their big litter box, but they find that your beds are uncomfortable, that they can't walk in them, but around the corner, there's a nice sandy area, they'll find that sandy area and they'll use it as a litter box. <coughs> you might be able to set up some other things to deter them, uh, motion detector sprinklers can also really work well with deterring cats and dogs in a garden. And it is a sprinkler that you hook up to your hose and it is motion activated. So most of the time it's not sprinkling, but as soon as it detects movement, it'll instantly start shooting out streams of water. And so if you use that in conjunction with a couple of these other methods, before long, the cats have no desire to ever go near your garden. And once you get them to that litter box, you can set up some of those methods like that sprinkler, um, maybe some uh, coyote urine, some of those other things to deter animals and you might be able to get the cats to go back to wherever they came from because they realize that your entire garden space is not friendly. But it does take one step at a time. It's not something that can happen overnight. Um, and as far as getting other animals um, out of your garden, um, it was um, a question, um, who did it come from? Um, Oh, I, I don't see the name, but the question was about um, PVC hoops and bird netting keeping deer out of the out, uh, away from the plants. And yes, that can be effective. Now, deer are grazers, and so they're just going to move from plant to plant, and kind of like the squirrels, they're pretty lazy. So if there is enough food, they're not going to try too hard to get food. They're just gonna move on to another area where food might be. They do serve a purpose. They eat some of those seed heads and the weeds early this time of year. I do try to deter deer from my garden. And I've got a video on that that shows some of the methods I use. One of the methods that I used around my fruit trees, my young fruit trees, was to put essentially a little trellis, a post, and over that post, I draped bird netting all around those young fruit trees. And I didn't have a problem with the deer eating through the netting and trying to get to those fruit trees. Now, any of the branches that had poked out from behind the bird netting, well, the deer would eat the tips of those branches. So if you're going to use bird netting, you need to make sure it completely covers the plant. In my strawberry bed, I did the same thing. I put a small hoop over the strawberries, covered it with bird netting, and had no issue from squirrels 
or deer or rabbits or anything else that uh, even the birds bird netting is good for birds so pvc hoops and netting can work to keep deer away from your plants but that's if there's food someplace else particularly in winter if you've got plants growing under hoops kale for instance or spinach that you might be growing through the winter you've got bird netting over that and there's no other food around then the deer will probably try to push through that netting to get to those plants so it's a deterrent it won't prevent the deer from eating your plants but it is something to consider as far as a control if you've got a deer problem and you want to help protect your plants um and but wayne you've got all kinds of information back and forth um you're bringing up the issue of voles and so i do have an issue with voles in my garden and this is one of those things where i like to use um, a nice layer of wood chips and voles are burrowing and tunneling just below the soil surface and they really like areas that have a nice mulch and so i haven't come across a really good way to keep voles under control uh, other than to try to keep them in an area away from some of my tender plants so the areas that i'm using the wood chip mulch are the areas that have my fruit trees and i have my fruit bushes and grasses and perennials that i know the voles typically don't eat but i do add a layer of or I should say a cylinder of mesh wire around those trees and around those bushes so that when the voles are burrowing and they discover some of those plants that I'm concerned they might start eating, they might start eating the bark around the trees. Well, that's what I do is I put a cover around the trunk or a cover around the stem so that the voles can't actually get to the plant to cause any problems. And if you've got any other suggestions or anything else that works, by all means, let me know. Um, a couple more things as we get closer to the end that I wanted to talk about this week. <coughs> One of them is actually working in the garden and what that means for you. As more and more people are watching more and more gardening videos, more and more people are watching my Gardener Scott videos, and more and more people are starting to want to garden. And that means there's more and more brand new gardeners out there. And it's really easy when you get into gardening that you discover you really love gardening. And so you wanna do more and more of it. And so the point I wanna bring up is don't overdo it. Don't hurt yourself. Gardening is a great way to get some physical activity. And especially if you're older, it might end up being a primary form of exercise. It is one of mine. When I moved five yards of soil in the last couple days, I used a shovel and a wheelbarrow. I shoveled the soil into the wheelbarrow, pushed the wheelbarrow into the backyard, shoveled it into my beds, and I got a great workout. I also was sore and I strained my back. So today I'm not going outside and shoveling more soil. And so think about your body and what it's capable of and don't overdo it. If you want to build a whole bunch of new raised beds, by all, my, by all means do that. But don't try to do it all in one day to the point that you throw out your back and now you've just lost a month or two as your back recovers. Garden smart. Take it slow. Take it as easy as you can and recognize the signs that your body tells you as far as pain and when you've overdone it. And take breaks and drink lots of water. Gardening can just take you away into another world. And I've fallen victim to this, where you go out and the next thing you know, you've been in the garden all day. 
you're sunburned, you didn't drink any water, you're sore, and now you have to spend a couple of days recovering because you just abused your body too much. Some of you younger people might not have as big an issue with it, but those of us that are a little bit older, you need to take it slow. So garden as much as you can, garden more this year if you can, but just don't overdo it. And I'll still do some seeds today, and I'll still take care of the plants I've got growing downstairs, but I'm not going to get outside and hurt myself. I'm taking a day off from the heavy physical activity. Okay, so I hope you are handling the world situation well. I hope it's not too stressful. I hope that the gardening is helping. And I wanted to talk a little bit about hoarding. We all are probably aware of the hoarding of things like toilet paper, food, things that you wouldn't think people might normally hoard in a crisis, but there's a lot of panic going on. And I haven't seen it yet, but I'm being made aware that the hoarding is actually also happening within the gardening world. That new gardeners or people that maybe had just started gardening go to the store and they're buying up more seeds than they could possibly use. They're hoarding seeds or they're hoarding small plants. Well, I ask you to stop and think about this. And I'm guessing that you being loyal watchers are not those type of people. <clears throat> but if you see that type of activity, if you go to your nursery or if you're at your big box store and you happen to see people buying a lot of plants, buying a lot of seeds, you might be able to tell, are they a new gardener or are they an experienced gardener? And I think gardeners have a particular look. You can tell if someone has been gardening for any period of time. And so if you see somebody that looks like they're buying more than they need, well, please take some time to explain to them what you might know about seeds. A package of lettuce seeds, for instance, might have 500 seeds within that packet. No average person is going to need that many lettuce seeds. So if someone is buying three or four packages of lettuce seeds, that probably identifies them as someone that really doesn't know what they're doing. So help me, help all of us by spreading some good information and asking the question, Hi, are you new to gardening? I see you're buying a lot of lettuce seeds. Are you planning on growing lettuce this year? And they'll probably say, yes, I'm new to garden. I want to grow a lot of lettuce. And then strike up a conversation where you can explain to them that they don't need 2,000 lettuce seeds. And if they're buying four packages of lettuce seeds, well, that means three other gardeners who want to buy a single packet won't be able to find one on the shelf. Don't panic when it comes to gardening. Be smart, be polite, be part of the entire world of gardening so that we can all work together and help each other out. <clears throat> now, you might be in an area like mine. My state is on a stay at home order, so I'm actually not at the nursery and I'm not at the big box stores buying plants or buying seeds. But hopefully soon enough, before my last frost date, when I'm actually getting back into the garden, things will lighten up, loosen up, and I'll get out there again. But let's not allow a few people to create a panic within the gardening world. Let's all of us think about what it is we really need, what it is we have the capability of growing, and really not buying or using any more than that to allow all the rest of us the opportunity to have their own gardens and grow their own plants. Um, so uh, we're getting much closer to the end now. I really appreciate all the information that's passing back and forth. When my monitor came back, it cut off the comment section, so I can't read all of the comments, which is why I haven't spent a lot of time 
um, looking at this week's comments, but I'll definitely review them. And next week we'll cover a lot of those topics as well. Um, let me review my list to see anything that I might have um, missed. Um, Okay, so Richard Lyle said, due to rain in East Tennessee, I am unable to purchase topsoil for another one to two months for my new raised bed garden. Um, thought I would use the garden soil from the big box stores. Um, this I've, I've covered in some previous videos, but the topic is what can you get away with buying and what should you make yourself and how should you buy things that you do want to buy? And so particularly topsoil that you buy, I want to suggest that you be careful. In most areas, and I know for sure in the state of Colorado, there are no regulations and there is no guidance about topsoil. That means anybody can sell dirt, call it topsoil, and you can buy it and put it in your garden. You don't know where it came from. You don't know if it was contaminated with something. And I've gotten a lot of reporting from different gardeners who have bought bags of topsoil. And inside those bags were broken glass and old aluminum cans and paper and plastic because all that manufacturer had to do was go out and dig up a bunch of dirt and put it into bags and label it as topsoil and people will buy it. So I suggest staying away from bagged topsoil as much as you can. Now, amendments like compost, peat, potting mixes that come in bags from reputable manufacturers, you don't have as much to worry about. And they will include on the back the ingredients because they're required to list the ingredients of those potting mixes. But you won't see an ingredient list on the bag of topsoil. So if you want topsoil, look for a landscape supply business in your particular area. The place that sells bark mulch in bulk, the place that sells sand, the place that sells rock, and they'll probably sell topsoil. And they should know where it came from. And you can actually go out on the lot and look through the topsoil to see if there's any of that glass or sticks or plastic or anything else before you buy it. Better yet, take your own native soil and amend it. Add compost, add aged manure, add organic material to your own native soil. If you've made leaf mold or have opportunity to get leaf, leaf mold, add that to your own soil. That's a much better way to get your soil going. And if you have one to two months of rain, it's going to keep you out of the garden. But in my opinion, it's better to wait until the rain stops and then work on getting into your soil with some good amendments than it is to buy a bagged product now that you really don't know what it contains. So it's up to you. I, I do understand for many people, bagged products are your only option, but I think it's better to buy a bagged compost, add it to your soil, than it is to buy a bag of topsoil. Um, okay, so we're getting real close to the 90 minutes that I promise you every week. Uh, thank you so much. It's good to see some new people that have popped up here. It's great to see the chat going back and forth. I look forward to getting back and reviewing your questions from this week and answering them next week. I encourage that your gardening week over the course of the next seven days is an active one for you. And it's a happy for one for you. And it's one that you can look back on and relax. 
and think about the success you had as you move forward into the next gardening week. Thank you so much for watching. I want to give a plug. It looks like there's 120 of you that are still on right now. My video coming out on Wednesday may be my favorite video yet. And I really think you're going to enjoy it. So if you're not a regular watcher of the videos, look at the video this Wednesday on the Gardner Scott channel because I think it's going to be something that will definitely make your day and will be something that I hope you share because I think it's very share worthy. Thank you so much. I'm Gardner Scott. Enjoy gardening.